I've never been someone who buys into ghost stories or anything like that, but what I saw a couple of months ago changed that. I don't expect everyone to believe me, but this happened and it's stuck with me since. My girlfriend, Rachel and I like exploring old abandoned places. We live in a rural part of Wisconsin, so there are plenty of them. Barns, farmhouses, things people just left behind. One weekend, we decided to check out this old farm about 20 minutes from town. We'd driven past it a few times, and it always caught our eye sitting there overgrown and forgotten. That day, everything seemed normal at first. The weather was clear, and nothing felt off until we got closer to the property. The place had this strange quietness to it. No wind, no animal sounds, not even the usual rustling from trees. It was like we walked into a bubble where everything just stopped. Neither of us said anything about it, but I could tell Rachel felt it too. The first thing we came up to was the barn. It was weathered, but what really stood out were these long, deep scratches in the wood. They were fresh, and something about them wasn't right. It looked like some animal with serious strength had clawed at the barn, but the spacing of the marks didn't make sense for any animal I knew. I joked that maybe a bear had wandered through, but it didn't feel like a joke. Inside, the barn was mostly empty. A few pieces of old equipment were lying around, but nothing exciting. Still, the sight of those scratches kept me on edge. They were too big, and it was clear they weren't made by any normal animal. I didn't say anything, but I was ready to move on quickly. Rachel suggested we check out the house next, so we headed over. The place was in bad shape. The roof was caved in, windows shattered, just the usual decay of a place left alone for decades. But when we got to the front door, I saw more of those scratches. These weren't like the ones on the barn. They looked deeper, like whatever made them had been trying to rip the door off its hinges. We both noticed it, but before we could decide whether to go inside, we heard something. It wasn't any animal sound I'd heard before. It was low, almost like a growl, but with this deep rumbling that I could feel in my chest. It came from behind the house, near the edge of the cornfield. We froze, listening, and the sound got louder. We could hear something moving through the corn. It wasn't fast, more like it was pushing through slowly, with purpose. Whatever it was, it was big. The corn was shifting, but not like something running through it, more like something heavy was brushing past, forcing its way through. Then we saw it. It stepped out from the edge of the cornfield, and it didn't look like anything I'd expected. It was tall, standing on two legs, but its proportions were all wrong. Its limbs were long and lean, almost lanky, but there was this unnatural strength to its posture. The head was what hit me the hardest. It had a snout, like a dog or a wolf, but its features didn't seem to belong on the body. Its skin looked tight, stretched thin over the bones, with patches of uneven fur here and there. It didn't move like a person or any animal I'd ever seen. Its steps were too smooth for something that size, but there was this calculated slowness to it, like it wasn't in a hurry, just taking its time as it watched us. It wasn't snarling or making any more noise now, just standing there, looking at us. Its eyes were deep-set, sharp, and they tracked us without blinking, like it was studying every move we made. Rachel tugged on my arm, and we started backing away. We didn't want to run, not yet, but as we stepped back it started moving too. Its body swayed with each step and it covered ground easily without needing to rush. There was something about the way it moved that was almost... patient. Like it knew it didn't need to hurry. We made it to the car, but my hands were shaking so bad I could barely get the key into the door. I fumbled with the lock, glancing over my shoulder. It was closer now, standing at the edge of the field still watching. It hadn't rushed us, hadn't lunged, just followed like it was waiting. I finally got the door open, and we scrambled inside. As I started the car and backed up, I saw it step into the open, leaving the shadows of the cornfield behind. Its head tilted slightly as it watched us pull away like it was trying to figure us out. I didn't look back after that. We drove straight home, and once we got there I checked the side of the car. There were deep scratches on the passenger side, four long marks that went down to the metal. I hadn't noticed when it happened, but they were there. 
and they matched the ones we'd seen at the barn. We haven't been back to that farm since, and I don't plan to. I've tried to find an explanation, but nothing I've found makes sense. It wasn't a normal animal, and whatever it was, it's still out there. I've been working for the city's subway system for about 12 years now, mostly as a train operator. It's not a glamorous job, but it pays the bills, and the late night shifts never really bothered me, until recently. You get used to the quiet when the trains stop running. The stations, which are usually buzzing with people, feel strange when they're completely empty. That quiet never unnerved me, though. Not until I started hearing stories about the old, unused sections of the subway. There's this tunnel that runs off from one of the main lines downtown, a part of the system that got shut down decades ago. I didn't think much of it at first. It's not uncommon for parts of old cities to have unused infrastructure. But in the last couple of months, a few of the guys started talking about people going missing down there. At first I figured it was just the usual rumors that spread around workplaces, but then I looked into it. Turns out, a couple of people had really disappeared. Both city workers and a few homeless people who had wandered into the tunnels. Most of them weren't noticed at first, but then one of our maintenance guys went missing. His name was Frank, and I used to chat with him every shift. He'd been with the subway system almost as long as I had. He was supposed to go down to the old tunnel for some routine check and he never came back. The city filed it as just another unfortunate disappearance, probably someone getting lost or hurt down there. But it didn't sit right with me. I'd always been skeptical of ghost stories or any talk about strange creatures lurking in the dark. But after Frank went missing, I started hearing weird things on my night shifts. Every once in a while, as I passed by that old tunnel, I'd hear something, kind of like a low hum, but it wasn't mechanical. It was too faint to be sure, but it always made me uneasy. The few times I mentioned it to my co-workers, they just shrugged it off or laughed. Then about two weeks ago, I got asked to take on a new shift, one that involved inspecting that old section of the tunnel. I wasn't thrilled about it, especially with everything that had been going around, but I didn't really have a choice. The job was simple enough take a quick walk down the tunnel to check for any structural issues and make sure there wasn't anything dangerous down there. So, last Friday, I grabbed my gear and headed down to the old station. By the time I got there, it was nearly midnight. The last of the regular trains had finished their routes and the place was completely empty. There's something unsettling about being in a subway station when it's that quiet. The hum of the lights overhead the faint clanking of distant machinery. It gets to you when there's no one else around. I made my way to the gate that led to the old tunnel, fumbling with the rusty lock for a bit before it finally creaked open. I stepped inside, and the change in atmosphere was immediate. The regular tunnels always have that faint smell of oil and machinery, but this place felt stale, like it hadn't been touched in years. The air was heavier too, cooler, almost damp. I clicked on my flashlight and started walking. At first, it was just an ordinary inspection. The tunnel was mostly intact, though there were signs of wear everywhere. Cracks in the walls, old wiring exposed here and there, but nothing that screamed danger. It was quiet, but this wasn't the peaceful quiet I was used to. This felt... off. As I got deeper into the tunnel, the feeling of being watched hit me. I stopped turning my flashlight in every direction, but there was nothing. Just the usual shadows playing tricks on my eyes. I shook it off, convincing myself it was just nerves from hearing all those stories. But then I heard it. A scraping sound, faint at first, but growing louder. It echoed off the walls, making it hard to tell where it was coming from. I stood still, straining my ears, and then it stopped. For a second, everything was silent again. I told myself it was probably a rat or some debris shifting around. But as I moved deeper, the sound came again, this time closer. I could feel my heartbeat picking up as I tried to focus on my surroundings. 
My flashlight was strong, but the darkness in that tunnel felt different, like it swallowed the light. Then I saw it. At first I thought it was just more debris. A few stones, maybe, or some old equipment shoved to the side. But as I got closer, I realized it was something else entirely. There, half hidden in the shadows, was a pile of what looked like clothes, ragged, torn and dirty. There were old boots, too. One of them flipped upside down. My stomach turned. They looked like they'd been down there for a while. The first thing that crossed my mind was the missing people. Was this... them? I didn't have much time to process it, though, because the scraping noise came back, louder and closer. I whipped around, my flashlight sweeping the tunnel behind me. This time, I saw something moving in the dark. It was subtle at first, but then it stepped into the beam of my light for just a second. It was tall, unnaturally so, and it moved with this hunched, jerky motion. I couldn't make out many details in that brief moment, but what I saw made my blood run cold. Its limbs were too long, its body too thin, and the way it moved wasn't like any person or animal I'd ever seen. Before I could react, it was gone, back into the shadows, leaving me standing there, heart pounding, in the silence of that old forgotten tunnel. For a few seconds I just stood there trying to process what I'd seen. My mind raced, scrambling to explain it away. Maybe it was just some homeless person, someone desperate enough to hide in the tunnels. But deep down, I knew that wasn't it. People don't move like that. I pointed my flashlight back where the thing had disappeared, half expecting it to jump out at me. But there was nothing, just the darkness and the echo of my own breathing. My feet were rooted to the spot, every instinct telling me to turn around and get out of there. But my job wasn't done. I still had to walk the length of the tunnel. I took a deep breath, wiped my sweaty palms on my pants and kept moving step by step. My flashlight flickered once and I stopped cursing under my breath. I tapped it lightly and the beam steadied. The quiet felt like it was pressing in on me, like the walls of the tunnel were closing in. I had only gone about thirty more feet when I heard it again. This time it wasn't scraping. It was something else, something worse. A low growl. The kind that you feel deep in your chest before you even hear it properly. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I swung the flashlight around, trying to pinpoint where it was coming from. The growling stopped, and for a brief second I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. But then there was a heavy thud, like something big had just hit the ground, followed by the unmistakable sound of something breathing. The beam of my flashlight cut through the dark, and there it was again. This time it didn't run. It stood there just at the edge of the light, watching me. I could only see part of it, the top of its body leaning forward, arms hanging too low as if it hadn't fully stood upright. Its legs were bent at weird angles, long and thin, almost like they shouldn't be able to hold it up. But what caught me most were its eyes. They didn't glow or reflect the light like you'd expect. They were dark, almost sunken, but there was something behind them, something that told me it wasn't just an animal. It was looking at me in a way that made my skin crawl, like it was sizing me up. I backed up a step, my boots scraping against the old concrete. The thing didn't move at first, just watched. I could hear it breathing, long and deep, as if it were waiting for something. Then, in one fluid motion, it stepped forward, this time fully upright. My flashlight beam shook in my hand, but I kept it trained on the thing as best I could. Its body was tall, easily over six feet, but it was the way it moved that freaked me out the most. Its limbs seemed too long for its body, and yet it moved with this eerie grace, like it was comfortable in the dark, like it belonged down here. I kept backing up, trying to keep my breathing steady. That's when I remembered the pile of clothes I'd found earlier. I glanced back just for a second at the spot where they had been. When I looked back at the creature, it was closer. I stumbled backward, nearly dropping the flashlight. My heart pounded in my ears. I knew I had to get out, but it was like my legs wouldn't cooperate. The thing tilted its head, like it was curious about my reaction. 
and then it did something I'll never forget. It smiled. Or at least, it looked like it was trying to. Its mouth stretched in this unnatural way, showing rows of sharp teeth, like it was mimicking what a smile should look like but didn't quite get it right. That was it for me. My body finally caught up with my brain, and I turned and ran. I didn't care anymore about the inspection, or the missing people, or anything else. I just needed to get out of that tunnel. As I ran, I could hear it behind me. Its footsteps were heavy, but it didn't sound like it was running, more like it was stalking me, keeping pace without even trying. I didn't dare look back. Every time I thought I might, I heard that low growl again, closer than before. The tunnels seemed to stretch forever, like no matter how fast I ran, the exit wasn't getting any closer. I could feel it behind me, not touching me, but close enough that I could feel its presence, the weight of it in the air. Finally, I saw the gate up ahead, the one I'd unlocked to get in. I sprinted toward it, my lungs burning, but just as I reached it, I felt something. Its breath on the back of my neck. It was so close I could hear the faint clicking of its teeth, like it was right on top of me. I threw myself through the gate and slammed it shut behind me. For a second I stood there, panting, flashlight shaking in my hand. I didn't hear anything on the other side of the gate. No footsteps, no growling, just silence. But I wasn't stupid enough to stick around. I bolted up the stairs and out of the station, not stopping until I was halfway across the street. Only then did I turn around expecting to see it standing at the entrance, watching me. But there was nothing. I quit the subway job a week later. I never told my boss the full story, just that I didn't feel safe in those tunnels anymore. They probably thought I was just another superstitious idiot. But I don't care. To this day, I can't walk near a subway station without getting that feeling in my gut again. That feeling of being watched. I don't know what that thing was, but I'm sure it had something to do with the people who went missing. And whatever it was, it's still down there. It was Christmas Eve, and my wife Sarah and I were on our way to my parents' place in the mountains of Colorado. They live in this little town you probably wouldn't even find on a map, out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by forest. It's been their retirement home for the last ten years, ever since my dad got out of the military. We try to make it out there every year, but this was the first time we were bringing Sarah with me for Christmas. We left our place in Denver early that morning, the car packed with presents and snacks for the road. It's about a six-hour drive to their house, so we had plenty of time to talk, listen to music and enjoy the snowy scenery. Sarah was excited to spend Christmas with my family. She'd only met them a handful of times, but she loved how laid back they were. My mom, especially, was one of those people who could make anyone feel at home, always laughing and smiling. About halfway through the trip, we stopped for gas and a quick bathroom break. It was freezing outside, around 10 degrees, and the snow had started to fall pretty heavily. I decided to give my mom a quick call to let her know we'd be there in a few hours. No answer. I tried again, still nothing. Weird, but not unheard of. They live in the sticks, after all, and cell service is pretty spotty. I shot her a text, letting her know we were on the way and we hit the road again. An hour later, I tried calling again. This time my dad's phone. Still no answer. I could feel a knot starting to form in my stomach, but I tried to shake it off. Maybe they were just busy getting things ready for dinner or out picking up last-minute groceries. I didn't want to worry Sarah, so I didn't mention it. But as we got closer to their house, I couldn't shake this feeling that something was wrong. We pulled up to their driveway just after dark. It was about 6 p.m., and the snow was still coming down hard. Their house was lit up like a Christmas tree, every window glowing with light. But something was off. The front door was wide open and there were no cars in the driveway. My parents' SUV should have been parked right there, but it wasn't. I put the car in park and stared at the house for a minute, my heart racing. Sarah looked over at me, noticing my unease. Is everything okay? She asked, her voice soft. 
I don't know, I said, more to myself than to her. Stay in the car for a second, I'm going to check things out. I stepped out into the cold and started walking up the driveway. The crunch of snow under my boots was the only sound, and with every step, that knot in my stomach grew tighter. When I reached the porch, I saw it. The claw marks. Deep, jagged scratches running across the wooden boards, like something had been dragging its nails along the porch. The front door was hanging open, one of the hinges bent and broken. The windows on either side were shattered, glass littering the ground. And then I saw the blood. It was smeared all over the porch, leading into the house. There were splatters on the walls, the door frame, and even on the Christmas lights that were strung up around the front window. It looked fresh, still dark red against the snow, and there were clumps of fur, greyish-brown scattered everywhere. My heart pounded in my chest, and I took a step back, feeling dizzy. I turned around and ran back to the car, my mind racing. Sarah rolled down the window, her face full of worry. We need to call 911, I said, fumbling for my phone. Something's wrong. Something bad happened. What? What did you see? She asked, her voice trembling. Just stay in the car, I said, dialing the number with shaking hands. The dispatcher picked up, and I tried my best to explain the situation. I told them about the blood, the broken windows, and how I couldn't get a hold of my parents. They said they'd send someone out right away, but given how remote the house was, it might take a while for them to arrive. While I was on the phone, I decided to try calling my mom again just in case. Maybe she was hiding somewhere, waiting for help. I pressed her contact and listened as the line rang. But then, something happened that made my blood run cold. I heard her ringtone. It wasn't coming from the house. It was coming from behind me, from the woods. I slowly turned around, my eyes scanning the dark tree line at the edge of the property, and that's when I saw it. Standing there, just inside the shadows, was something wrong. It was tall, easily nine feet or more, towering over the bushes and branches around it. It had the shape of a man, but its arms and legs were too long, its body too lean. The head was what got me the most. It was shaped like a dog or a wolf, with a long snout and pointed ears that twitched in the wind. Its fur was matted, covered in dark patches that could have been dirt or blood. And in its mouth, it was chewing on something, something fleshy. My mom's phone kept ringing from somewhere near its feet. I froze, unable to breathe, unable to move. Sarah saw the look on my face and followed my gaze. I don't know if she saw it the same way I did, but the next thing I knew, she was screaming. I grabbed her arm and pulled her out of the car. Get inside! I yelled, dragging her toward the house. We bolted up the steps, slipping on the blood-slicked porch, and slammed the front door shut behind us. I could hear the thing moving in the woods, twigs snapping under its weight. We didn't stop running until we reached the nearest room, the bathroom at the back of the house. We locked the door, huddling together in the dark. Sarah was crying, shaking uncontrollably. I tried to calm her down, but my own heart was pounding so hard I could barely think straight. All I could do was pray that the police would get there soon. We sat, huddled in the dark bathroom, our breaths barely audible as we waited for the police to arrive. Sarah was shaking, her face pale and I could barely think straight. The ringing of my mom's phone still echoed in my ears. The thing out there, whatever it was, had my mom's phone. Or worse, it had her. I didn't say any of this to Sarah. She was already on the edge of a full breakdown, and I wasn't doing much better. I kept staring at the door, half expecting it to burst open any second, with that thing barging in. The growling and scraping noises we'd heard earlier had stopped, but I knew it wasn't gone. It was waiting. I checked my phone again, praying the police would show up soon. It had been only a few minutes, but it felt like an eternity. We couldn't stay in the bathroom forever, though. We needed to get out of the house. Suddenly I heard the faintest sound from outside the window, the crunch of snow underfoot. My heart leaped into my throat. I reached for the window, trying to open it wider, but the old frame was jammed. I shoved it with all my strength, and finally, 
It creaked open just enough for us to slip out. I helped Sarah through first, and she dropped into the snow silently. I followed quickly behind her, my heart pounding in my chest. As soon as I was outside, I grabbed her hand and we started running, straight for the driveway where I hoped the police would be pulling up any second. The cold air burned my lungs, but I didn't care. I just wanted to get as far away from the house as possible. We had only made it halfway across the yard when we heard something from the woods behind us. It was faint at first, like the snap of a branch, but then it grew louder, a heavy, slow movement, like something large was stalking us. I glanced over my shoulder, and that's when I saw it again. It was standing at the edge of the forest, just beyond the tree line. Its massive shape was partially obscured by the shadows, but there was no mistaking what it was. Tall, covered in fur and hunched over slightly, like it was watching us. It was too far away for Sarah to see clearly, but I could feel its eyes on me. I froze in place, gripping Sarah's arm tighter. Don't look back, I whispered. What is it? she asked, her voice trembling. Just keep moving. But she couldn't help herself. She turned and I heard her gasp. Oh my God, what is that? Before I could respond, headlights appeared in the distance cutting through the darkness. The police were finally here. Relief flooded through me, and I tugged Sarah forward, urging her to run faster. We sprinted toward the driveway just as the squad car pulled up, and two officers stepped out. Hey, I shouted, waving my arms. Over here. The officers immediately ran toward us, their hands on their holsters. Are you the ones who called 911? One of them asked. Yes, I gasped, still trying to catch my breath. It's in the woods. There's something in the woods. The officers exchanged a quick glance before one of them raised his flashlight and shone it toward the tree line. I could still see the creature, barely visible between the trees, but the beam didn't reach far enough to illuminate it clearly. There's something out there, I insisted, pointing toward the spot where I'd seen it. It was huge. One of the officers squinted, scanning the area with his flashlight. I don't see anything. It's there, I nearly shouted. It's right there. Sarah grabbed my arm, shaking her head. I don't know what I saw, she whispered, her voice trembling. Maybe it was just... an animal? I turned to her in disbelief. No, it wasn't just an animal. You saw it too. You know that wasn't normal. The officer closest to us cleared his throat, drawing our attention. Let's take a look inside the house first. You said there's blood? I nodded, frustrated that they weren't more concerned about the thing lurking in the woods. But what could I say? It wasn't like they'd seen what I had. The other officer stayed outside, keeping an eye on the tree line, while the first one led us back toward the house. The door was still wide open, and as we stepped inside, the officer's flashlight swept over the bloodstains, the shattered windows, and the claw marks etched into the porch and walls. Jesus, he muttered under his breath, you weren't kidding. I pointed toward the fragments of fur scattered across the floor. That thing did this, I saw it. The officer knelt down to examine the fur, frowning. What kind of animal leaves fur like this? I didn't know how to answer him. All I could think about was the thing standing in the woods, watching us. Look, I said, my voice shaking. I know this sounds crazy, but I'm telling you, it was huge. Like, nine, ten feet tall. It wasn't a bear and it wasn't a wolf. It was something else. The officer looked at me, his expression unreadable. You saw this with your own eyes? Yes, I said, my voice firmer now. And I heard my mum's phone ringing out there. Whatever that thing was, it has her. He didn't respond right away. Instead, he stood up and motioned for us to follow him outside. We'll call for backup, he said. You both need to stay in the car until more units arrive. I could tell he didn't believe me. Not really. He was being polite, but there was a look in his eyes, like he thought I was just scared out of my mind imagining things but I knew what I saw. And as we walked back toward the squad car, I couldn't help but feel like it was still out there, lurking just beyond the trees, waiting for another chance to strike. We climbed into the back seat of the police car, and I watched as the officer radioed for backup. Sarah leaned her head against my shoulder, still trembling. 
I wrapped my arm around her, trying to offer some comfort, but I couldn't stop my own hands from shaking. A few minutes later, more police cars arrived, along with a couple of search dogs. The officers set up a perimeter around the house, but I could tell they didn't really expect to find anything, not something like what I'd seen. As the night dragged on, and more officers combed through the woods and searched the house, I started to feel that sinking dread again. They weren't going to find my parents. That thing, it had taken them. Hours passed before they let us go. They took our statements, promised to keep us updated, and gave us a ride to a nearby motel. Sarah didn't say much on the way there, and I could tell she was still trying to process everything, but I couldn't shake the feeling that it wasn't over. That creature was still out there, and whatever it was, it wasn't finished. As I lay in bed that night staring at the ceiling, I could still hear the faint echo of my mom's phone ringing in the dark woods, far beyond the reach of any help. I've never really told anyone this story outside of my close circle of friends, but after listening to some of the stories on your channel, I thought maybe it's finally time to share it. This happened years ago, back when I was a sophomore in high school. I grew up in a small town in Michigan, a pretty typical middle-of-nowhere kind of place. There wasn't much to do around there, so when the fall rolled around, everyone got excited for this big haunted forest event that the local church put on every year. It wasn't anything fancy, but for a small town it was a big deal. The church ran it as a fundraiser, and they went all out. There were actors dressed up like zombies, vampires, and whatever else was popular that year. They'd hide behind trees, jump out at you. You know, typical haunted house type stuff, but in the middle of the woods. It wasn't terrifying by any means, but it was fun, especially if you went with a group of friends. That year, my buddies and I were excited to go, mostly because some of the girls we liked were going too, and we figured it'd be a chance to hang out and impress them by not acting scared. I remember it was a Friday night early October. The air had that crisp fall chill, and the leaves were already starting to change color. My friends and I met up at the church parking lot around 7 p.m. There was Matt, Kyle, Jason, and a few others and we were all hyped up, joking around and trying to act cool. The girls were already there when we arrived, and we all paid our entrance fee, got our little wristbands, and waited in line to start the walk through the woods. The forest they used wasn't huge, but it was big enough to make the whole thing take about 30 to 40 minutes. They had a trail marked out with ropes and lanterns, so you didn't get lost, and there were different scare zones set up along the way. I remember we were about halfway through, when things started to get weird. It was dark by then, and the only light we had came from the lanterns and the flashlights people brought. We'd already passed through a few of the typical setups. Some guy in a hockey mask jumping out with a fake chainsaw. Some vampires creeping out from behind the trees. That kind of stuff. We were laughing and having a good time, but then we came up to this part of the trail where everything felt different. The actors up ahead were dressed like werewolves, which I remember thinking was cool because they actually looked pretty legit. One of the girls with us, Sarah, joked that they must have gotten the costumes from some Hollywood set or something because they looked so good. There were three or four of them, standing in the shadows of the trees, but one in particular caught our attention. It was standing farther back than the others, sort of hunched over and it wasn't moving. At first I thought maybe it was just trying to scare us by staying perfectly still, but something about it didn't feel right. I remember nudging Matt and whispering, Dude, check that one out, that looks way too real. He nodded but didn't say anything, just kept staring at it. The more we looked at it, the more unsettling it became. Its fur was matted and filthy like it had been rolling around in mud or worse. Its face didn't have that typical mask look either, there was too much detail. The muzzle looked too lifelike, like an actual animal, and the way it was breathing was... strange, slow and deep, almost like it was controlling itself, trying not to move too much. And then its eyes. They were glowing, but not in that fake way like LED lights. They had this dull, yellowish glow, 
like the reflection you see in an animal's eyes when headlights hit them at night. I heard Kyle behind me whisper, Holy shit, that's some next level stuff. How the hell did they make that thing so real? We all laughed nervously, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously off. Then I saw it. Blood. There was blood dripping from its claws, slowly pooling on the ground beneath it. It wasn't fake blood either, not that bright neon red stuff they use for Halloween props. This was dark, almost black, and the smell got the smell. It hit us all at once, this rancid, wet dog stench, like something had been left to rot in a swamp. It was so strong we all started gagging. Sarah was the first to say something. That's not part of the act, is it? Before anyone could answer, the thing moved. Not much, just a slight shift in its stance, but enough to make it clear that this wasn't an actor in a costume. The way its body moved, the muscles rippling under its fur. It was too natural, too fluid. Jason muttered, We need to get out of here, but none of us could move. We were all just staring at it, waiting for it to do something. Then it growled, this low guttural sound that made my stomach drop. We all knew right then and there that this wasn't part of the haunted forest. This thing wasn't an actor, and whatever it was, it wasn't friendly. I don't remember who started running first, but within seconds we all bolted. We didn't stop to check if anyone was behind us. We just ran as fast as we could, weaving through the trees, stumbling over roots and rocks, trying to get back to the entrance. The whole time I kept expecting to hear footsteps behind us, or worse, to feel claws digging into my back. But all I could hear was the pounding of my heart and the sound of my friend's panicked breathing. We burst through the exit, out of breath and terrified, and immediately went to find someone in charge. But no one believed us. They thought we were just trying to mess with them, or that we'd seen one of the actors and gotten scared. We didn't stick around to argue, we just wanted to get the hell out of there. That night, we found out that a group of high schoolers had gone missing. They'd been in the forest around the same time we were, but no one ever saw them again. The police searched the woods for days, but they didn't find a single trace. No bodies, no clothes, nothing. After that year, the church stopped hosting the haunted forest. People in town started whispering about what we saw, and the rumors have stuck around ever since. Even now, all these years later, I still can't explain what we saw that night. But I know one thing for sure. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't human. Now here's where it gets really messed up. Not even a few weeks ago, before I'm writing this, there was another disappearance in that same area of the woods where that haunted forest attraction used to take place all those years ago. It was all over the local news, and when I saw the report, chills ran down my spine. They were saying that a group of college students had gone hiking in those woods, and just like those high schoolers years back, they vanished without a trace. They sent out search parties, and just like before, the investigation turned up empty. They searched high and low, combing through the underbrush, but there was no sign of the students. No personal items, no clothes, nothing at all. It felt like they just disappeared into thin air, and I knew that the creature was back. The very thought made me sick. I will update and send in any new information if the police come up with anything. Until then, please stay safe if you are out in the woods in Ohio. It's not safe. I've been fishing in the Pacific Northwest for years, hitting up spots no one else seems to bother with. It's peaceful out there, quiet, with nothing but the sounds of the river and wildlife around you. But this one night, about a year ago, I got more than I bargained for. It was late, maybe 10 or 11 at night, and I had just settled in at one of my favorite secluded riverbanks. It's a spot that takes some effort to get to, about a 20 minute hike through thick trees not a place you'd find by mistake. The night was calm, almost too calm. There wasn't a breeze and the water moved slow like it was tired. Perfect for fishing, if you ask me. I had my line cast out, just sitting back waiting when I started hearing these splashes from farther upstream. Not like fish jumping, 
but more like something big moving through the water. At first, I didn't think much of it. There are all kinds of animals out here, and sometimes they come to the river for a drink or to cross over. But the splashing kept coming in bursts, slow and steady. Every time I glanced upstream, there was nothing, just the dark water and the reflection of the moonlight. I shrugged it off, figuring whatever it was had gone on its way. But it didn't. It kept coming. I was starting to get that uneasy feeling you can't explain. The kind where your gut is telling you something's off. I've spent a lot of time in the woods, and that instinct doesn't kick in for no reason. But I wasn't ready to pack it up yet. I figured I'd give it another half hour before calling it a night. That's when I saw it. The moon shifted just right, casting light over the river, and there it was, standing halfway in the water near the reeds on the opposite bank. At first, I didn't know what I was looking at. It was tall, taller than any person, but the way it stood was strange. It was hunched but still upright, like it wasn't fully comfortable in that position. What threw me off were the eyes. They were locked right on me, almost like it had been watching me this whole time. I couldn't make out too much of its body because of the water and the reeds, but its head, it looked like some kind of wild dog or wolf with these thick, pointed ears and a snout that just seemed too long, but it wasn't behaving like any animal I'd ever seen. I froze. My mind raced, trying to figure out what the hell this thing was. It wasn't moving much, just standing there, half in the water, staring at me. I could feel my pulse in my throat, but I didn't move. I didn't want to provoke it, whatever it was. Then it made this noise. I don't know how to describe it exactly. It wasn't a growl or a howl. It was more like a grunt, but deep, like it was coming from way down in its chest. It didn't sound natural, almost like it was trying to say something, but it didn't know how. That's when I realized this thing wasn't just curious. It was here for me. It was too intentional, too focused. I've never felt that kind of pressure before, like I was prey. It stood there for what felt like forever, watching me. I've had encounters with wildlife before, but nothing that made me feel like I was on the menu. This thing wasn't going to just wander off. I didn't know what to do. Every part of me wanted to pack up and get the hell out of there, but I didn't want to make any sudden moves. Then, after what seemed like an eternity, it moved. Slowly it started wading further out of the water. That's when I saw more of it. Its body wasn't right. It was covered in thick, wet fur, but the way it was built didn't match any animal I knew. It was bulky, but lean at the same time, with long limbs that seemed too flexible for something its size. The thing took a few more steps out of the river, and the sound of the water moving around its legs was loud in the quiet night. Every step it took was deliberate, like it was testing the ground, making sure not to slip. It never took its eyes off me. I could see more of its face now. The snout was long and jagged, like it had been in some fight before. Its ears twitched every so often, like it was listening for something I couldn't hear. And those eyes. They weren't glowing or anything dramatic like that, but they were intense. Almost too human, which made it worse somehow. It made that sound again, that deep, guttural grunt, and it raised its head like it was smelling the air. I don't know if it was trying to figure me out or warn me off, but it didn't seem to be in any rush to leave. The way it held itself, like it was comfortable in both the water and on land, made me realize something. This thing had probably been watching me for a while. Maybe it had been in the water the whole time, hidden by the reeds, waiting for the right moment. And now it was sizing me up. My heart was pounding, but I forced myself to stay calm. If it wanted to come after me, I knew I wouldn't be able to outrun it. Not through the woods. My best bet was to make it clear I wasn't worth the trouble. I did the only thing I could think of. Slowly, I reached down and grabbed a rock from the riverbank. It wasn't much, but it was something. I stood up, trying not to make any sudden movements, and chucked the rock into the river, aiming just to the left of where the thing was standing. The splash was loud, and for a second, it looked away. Just a quick glance toward the sound, but it was enough. 
As soon as its eyes left mine, I turned and ran. I didn't look back. I could hear splashing behind me, but I didn't want to know if it was following me or not. The trail back to my truck was rough, but I didn't stop. Branches whipped at my face, and the root seemed to reach up to trip me, but I kept going. I could still hear something crashing through the trees behind me, and I wasn't about to stop and find out if it was that thing or just my imagination. I don't know how long it took, but when I finally made it back to my truck, I was a mess. I fumbled with my keys, got inside and slammed the door shut. I started the engine and peeled out of there, the tires kicking up dirt as I sped down the road. I didn't look in the rearview mirror. I couldn't. I've thought about that night a lot since then, trying to make sense of what I saw. People can say whatever they want, but I know what I saw wasn't normal. It wasn't some animal passing by, and it wasn't a figment of my imagination. It was there, and it was watching me. I haven't been back to that spot since, and I don't plan to. Whatever that thing was, I don't want to see it again. <laughs>